Hello everyone, I am Pastor Brett Pazder, and today at this time I am going to be going through the most important, the most valuable, and the most precious message of all the history of mankind. And the message that I'm going to go through today is the Gospel. It's also known as the Way of Salvation. You know, I think that this message is so important for today. You know, if you just turn on the news, you can see that you know, there's so much tragedy, corruption, murder, war. So many terrible things are taking place throughout the world. And even in your own life, you may feel like, you know, why is there so many problems happening? Why are there so many tragedies in my life, so many hardships? And so the question we can ask is, why do these things happen? Why is this happening to me? And that's why the gospel is so important, because the gospel answers that question, why this happens? And it also gives us the most precious answer and solution to this. And so at this time, I'd like to go through with you the gospel, also known as the way of salvation. Now the gospel, also known as the good news, it always starts with God. So God, what are some attributes of God? God is creator. God is also love. God is just. God is, of course, good. God is spirit. And God is holy. So, of course, there's more attributes of God, but those are just a few. And God, as creator, he created all things. You know, he created the heavens and the earth. He created everything in the world, the plants, the animals, the fish in the sea, the birds of the air. And he also created man. And he created man distinct from all other creation. It says in Genesis 127, that he created mankind in his own image. It says, in his image, he created man, male and female. But what really is that image? One of the attributes of God is that he is spirit. So he created mankind as spiritually alive. So we are physical beings, of course, but we're also spiritual beings. If you look at Genesis 2-7, it says that God formed man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living being. So God created us with his spirit to be with him. In Genesis 1-28, it says he blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living creature that walks along the ground. So God blessed us with authority over all of creation. And so that's the order of things. We have God above us, we have us, and then we have God's creation which he gave us to rule over. So we are basically the kings and queens of the world, ruling over God's creation. And honestly, that's the way God designed us to be, to be with him. In the same way fish are meant to live in the water, we are meant to live in a relationship with God. And in that way, everything's good. You know, at this time at creation, you know, there's no hardship, there's no pain. You know, there were no, no knee problems, no elbow problems, no stress, no anxiety. You know, work was good. We worked in the garden, and it was good. There's no trouble. We worked with God. And that's where we're meant to be. But something happened. You know, a part of God's love for us, and just love in general, if you think about love, the essence of love is there must be a choice. God truly desires for us to love him. And so to make that a choice for us to love him, he created 
the tree of good and evil. You know, God said to Adam that if you eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, you will surely die. You know, God gave us all the other trees and all the other fruit to eat of. But he says, if you eat of this, you will surely die. And it's because God wanted to give us a choice. Because if you think about it, you know, for love to really take effect, for love to be true, you know, it has to be a choice. You know, if God just programmed us or created us as a robot, programmed to love him, that's not true love. You know, they're just following commands. But to be truly and fall in love with someone, you need to have that choice. And so God gave us this choice. You know, basically, follow me and my word, or follow the alternative, which is there. And so what happened is there was an event that took place in Genesis 3, 1 to 6. You know, Satan, he came down in the form of a serpent. And he came to Eve, and he said that if you eat of the tree, you will naturally die. So what is he doing? He's basically lying. That's exactly what he's doing. God said, you will surely die. But Satan is saying, if you eat of it, you will not die. So he's blatantly lying to Eve. And then he also adds something to that. He says, actually, if you eat of the fruit, you will be like God. You know, you will be like God. You no longer have to be under God, is basically what he's saying. You no longer have to follow him and what he desires. Be with him. You can stand at the same level as God. Be his equal. So when she saw that that fruit was desirable for gaining knowledge, she ate of it. She gave some to Adam, who was with her, and he ate of it. And we call that sin. That is original sin. And when we ate of that fruit, when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, they sinned and they became separated from God. Because God, he is a holy God. And what that means is he is set apart. He cannot be with sin. So when we ate of it, the spirit that was in us, it died. We became spiritually dead. And eventually, of course, we die physically as well. But this isn't just something that happened to Adam and Eve. It says this is carried on generation to generation to generation. It's a seed of sin that's carried on. It says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, there is no one that is good. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners under this sin. And it says in 1 John 3, 8, He who does what is sinful is of the devil. As sinners, we are of the devil. We are under Satan. So what basically happened is, you know, instead of listening to God, we listened to Satan. And so now everything is flipped around. You know, the order was God, us, and creation to rule over. But now it's flipped. Now we, because we listen to Satan's word above God's, Satan is above us. And the creation that we were meant to rule over, now it rules over us in that it causes us stress, anxiety, pain, just to survive you have to work really hard. You know, there are curses that came to us. We call this problem, that we were separated from God, we have sin, we're under Satan. This is original sin, theologically. It's also known as the fundamental problem because it's the problem that all mankind has. No matter who you are, where you're born, everyone has this problem. And this sin, what it does is it creates this divide between God and man. Sin has caused this division. And it says that in Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. So over here, we are dead. We are dead in our transgressions and sins. And here, as a non-believer, not believing in God, which is everyone in this world, we are under curses. We are non-believers.
In John 8, 44, Jesus himself says, Your father is the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He is a liar. You know, it says, he is your father. So we become children of the devil. We also do idol worship. You know, we worship different objects, you know, nature or different statues or different things. You know, idols can take different forms. What it basically is, is an idol is something that has taken the place of God in your life. You know, we are created with God's Spirit in us. You know, we're like a cup with water in it. That's the way we were created. But now that water has been poured out and now we're empty. You know, we're spiritually dead. So we have this emptiness in us. It's like a void. And we try to fill it with different things to become happy to become complete. You know, some people fill it with different religions, worshiping idols, worshiping objects. Some people fill it with money. You know, some people fill it with, you know, pleasure. Some people fill it with drugs. They're all trying to satisfy this craving that they have, and they can't. So they turn to these idols to find satisfaction, but they never find it. They're never satisfied. And because we're not satisfied without God's Spirit, we suffer from different mental problems. You know, other things like anxiety, stress, depression. And depression can lead to things like suicide. But even things such as schizophrenia, bipolar disease. You know, all these mental problems that people have it is because of this spiritual problem of being separated from God. You know, we have these mental problems that we can't be solved because we're not satisfied. And that is why in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus himself says, Come to me, all those weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's because what we're lacking in this world is true peace. No one has true peace. And because of this, we also have physical problems. You know, physical problems. People are born with different ailments. They're born with disabilities. You know, blind, deaf, mute. You know, there are other physical problems we can see with our eyes, such as war famine, poverty, you know, all these different physical problems that we have in this world. It says in Acts 8, 4 to 8, you know, Philip, he went to this city called Samaria, and there he was casting out demons in the name of Jesus Christ's name. And these demons had possessed people, causing them to be cripples. And after they were cast out, after the demon was cast out through the name of Jesus, it says there was great joy that came to that city. We also have the problem of the afterlife, because this life is not all there is. There is an afterlife. And for those that are separated from God, they are eternally separated from God in death, in that they are sent to hell, a place of suffering. And it says in Luke 16, 19 to 31, that between heaven and hell, there's this great divide, a chasm that's fixed. And after you die, you cannot cross over from one to the other. You cannot cross over from hell to heaven. It is impossible after death. It's only in this life where you have the opportunity to receive salvation and meet with God. And then finally, we also have spiritual inheritance. It says in Exodus 24 to 5 that those fathers that, that committed idolatry, their children were cursed to the third and fourth generation. And I've seen this, you know, in real life as well. Now, I've met a girl, she was a single mother. And the thing is, her mother before her was a single mother. And the mother before her was a single mother 
as well. For three generations, the husbands or the fathers had left the family. You know, or else you could see this in abusive relationships. When parents abuse their children, what ends up happening when the children grow up? They end up abusing their children as well a lot of times. It's the cycle that keeps happening again and again. It's a spiritual inheritance. Now you could also see this in things like alcoholism. Genetically, you could pretty much see this. You know, if the parents were alcoholics, the children are prone to become alcoholics as well. That is a spiritual inheritance. And there's only one thing that could cut this off, and that's the gospel of Christ. But a lot of people don't know that. And so they try to solve this problem through different ways. They try to solve it through different works. You know, they believe that if they do a lot of good deeds, that they could balance out the scales. And so they'll, they'll do something bad, but they'll do something good to balance it out. And in the end, God will see that, and he'll allow them to go to heaven. You know, they think that if they do good works, that's their ticket to heaven. Or they think that religion is the answer. You know, if they're truly devout in, in, in worshiping some God, in some religion, that they're going to be saved. But this is all man's efforts to reach God, and they all fall short. Now, there's a lot of people that think education is the answer. You know, they look at the crime, they look at the way society is, and they say, the problem is people just aren't educated enough. If we educate them, these problems will go away. And they feel that, you know, maybe if we continue on and we progress with technology, things will get better. You know, at one point we can reach this utopia where everything is perfect. And that's where we're headed, to this utopia. But the reality is, this isn't happening. You know, there are some problems getting solved, but then there, there are new problems and more problems being added. You know, these days, there's so much depression, there's so much suicide, there's so many broken marriages. And, you know, they think that we can head to this ideal system. You know, things like communism. It's really ideal, you know, in the way it should work. But in reality, it doesn't. Because it doesn't account for one thing this problem of original sin that's in everyone. You know, the leaders of these communist countries, they have this. So when the power gets to them, when the greed gets to them, you know, the people under them suffer. Though it should work, it doesn't because it doesn't account for sin. And so God, he knows of this situation. He knew this was going to happen. So he provided the solution from the beginning. Right after we sinned, God gave the solution. He said the offspring of the woman would crush the serpent's head. The offspring of the woman would crush the serpent's head. The serpent is Satan. So someone was going to come to defeat Satan's work and the offspring of the woman. Not the offspring of man. We are all the offspring of man under this sin. But the offspring of woman points to a virgin birth. And in Isaiah 7.14, it says, the virgin will give birth to a child, and you will call him Emmanuel, God with us. And so God came to us. God came to us, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. You know, a lot of people, they just think his name is Jesus Christ, like Christ is his last name. But Christ is actually a title. You know, in the same way, president is a title, doctor or teacher. These are titles for people, for offices. Christ is the office that Jesus held. Christ means anointed one. Because Jesus came to be the anointed one. And this is Christ. It comes from a Greek word, Christos. But in the Old Testament, they were always looking for the coming Christ. But they would use the Hebrew word, Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one. They're always looking towards the anointed one coming. 
and the Anointed One come, and He is the Christ. So Jesus is the Christ. And we call Jesus the Christ or the Anointed One because He fulfilled three offices that are talked about in the Old Testament. The first office is the office of the prophet. You know, the prophet's role was to turn people to God. You know, all the people, all the Israelites, they kept turning to idols, idols of different nations, to sin. And the prophet would tell them, turn away from that sin and those idols and turn back to the one true God. And so Jesus came to be the true prophet. In John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14 it says, The Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. So God coming to man. And Jesus himself said, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the unique and only way to God. He shows us the way. The other office that was anointed in the Old Testament, a lot of times by oil, was the priest. And the priest's role was to offer up sacrifices, the blood sacrifice for people's sin. So if you came and you had a sin, you'd bring an unblemished animal, a perfect animal, like a lamb. And the priest would take his hand, place it on your head, and transfer your sin to the animal and shed the animal's blood. Because the price of sin, the price of sin is death. And so that animal would take your place, be in your atonement. So Jesus Christ came as the true priest because he is our atoning sacrifice. It says in Romans 8, 2, that through the Spirit of Christ Jesus, I have been set free from the law of sin and death. It's a law we're under. The law, if you sin, you die. We are sinners, we deserve to die. But he sets us free from that through his Spirit. Through his death on the cross, he became our sacrifice. And finally, Jesus Christ came as the true king. Because kings, they have authority over all land, over all things. And Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he died paying for our sins, and he resurrected, defeating the work of the devil. And in doing so, all authority in heaven and on earth is his. So he is the true king. And it says in 1 John 3, 8, the second part of this verse says, The reason the Son of Man came was to destroy the work of the devil. So you, think, so you see, as Jesus, as the Christ, as the true prophet, the true priest, and true king, he solves these problems. As a true prophet, he shows us the way to meet with God. As a true priest, he takes care of our sin problem. As a true king, he destroys the work of the devil. And it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you believe Jesus Christ is Lord and confess, with, confess this with your mouth, you will be saved. For it is in your heart that you are justified, and you, with your mouth you confess and are saved. So a lot of times this comes as a prayer. If you pray, you know, acknowledging sin, acknowledging sin in your life, and ask that Jesus Christ comes into your life, you can be saved. And this is a precious thing. It says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it is by grace we are saved, through faith. This is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You know, it's a gift of grace that we receive salvation. You know, because ultimately, we're here. You know, we are sinners. We deserve to die and to go to hell. And our works, they don't do anything. But God shows us grace. And that grace comes in the form of Jesus Christ dying on the cross in our place. If you truly acknowledge and understand what God's grace is, it's an amazing gift. It's an amazing thing. 
is undeserved favor. It's the most precious thing in the world. And if you believe Jesus is the Christ, if you are saved, it says you cross over from death to life. In John 5, 24. And when you cross over from death to life, it is eternal life. And over here, you are blessed. One of the first blessings is You are no longer a child of the devil, but you become a child of God. Yet to those that received him, to those that believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we become God's children. We are adopted into his family. We also receive guidance of the Holy Spirit that dwells with us. In John 14, 16 to 17, it says the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, is with you and in you. In 26 and 27, it says that this Counselor, this Advocate or Helper, this Counselor is going to guide you by teaching you and reminding you of what Jesus said, of God's Word. We also receive answers to prayer as a part of the blessing. In John 14, 14, it says, Ask anything in my name and I will do it. And this is one of the blessings that we have as just children. Because, you know, everyone prays. A lot of people pray. And God can hear their prayers. But what sets us apart is that God answers us because we are His children. We also have authority over the force of darkness. In Luke 10, 19, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. This is the authority that we're given in Jesus Christ's name to overcome all the forces of darkness. We also have a background of heaven. So we have angels that are sent on our behalf. In Hebrews 1.14, it says, Are not angels ministering spirits sent to serve those that will inherit salvation? In Philippians 1.20, it says, We are citizens of heaven. And we eagerly await our Savior from there. Our background is no longer this world. This is not our home. It says we are basically sojourners here. This is temporary. And our true home is in heaven, where we are citizens of heaven. And our final blessing, of course there are many more, but our final blessing here is world evangelization. In Acts 180 says, But you will see power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Judea, Judea Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know, world evangelization, being able to share this gospel to other people. You know, at first I wondered, you know, how is sharing this gospel to other people a blessing to us? Because a lot of people think of it as a hindrance or a burden. But if you think about it, God could have chosen any method to share the gospel. He could have sent angels to go proclaim the gospel, you know, through the skies to all people. But what is the method that God chose? He chose to work through you and through me to share this gospel to all people. You know, it's because ultimately God wants to work with us, to restore that relationship. In the same way we used to work with God in the Garden of Eden, God wants to work with us for his greatest desire, which is restoring people to life, you know, bringing them salvation. That is why this is a blessing to share the gospel. 
So if you look at this again, you see that these things, being a child of God, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, being able to pray, this is dealing with our relationship with God. And it restores this, our identity. It restores our identity where we are once again with God. It's a blessing. And this part is about our authority. We have our restored authority. So basically when we meet with God through Jesus Christ, it's a restoration of the way things were meant to be, the original design. So I pray that this message is a message that really, you understand, is victory in Jesus Christ. You know, the Greek word for gospel, it's euangelion. And this Greek word, a lot of times it was used um, for military. Whenever there was victory in battle, they would send someone, a messenger, to proclaim the good news in the different cities. They would share the good news of victory. And that is what the gospel is. It's the good news that we proclaim. It's news of victory, that Jesus Christ has overcome the power of the enemy, of this devil, of Satan. So for those that are in Jesus Christ, we are truly victorious because we have eternal life. And I pray that you can truly hold on to this message and know that this is the truly most blessed message that you can ever receive. Let's pray at this time. Dear Father God, we just thank you once again for this day and this opportunity to go through your word together. We thank you, Father God, that even though we are sinners deserving of hell, deserving of death, that because of your love for us, yet while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us, that we may be reunited with you, that we may have a relationship with you. And Father God, it's not only that we are you know, free of our sin, but you blessed us by bringing us into your family as children of God. So I pray that, Father God, from this day on, we can truly enjoy victory in Christ Jesus, enjoying our identity in Christ, enjoying our authority in Christ, and enjoying Emmanuel each and every day. We thank you for this time, and we pray this in your Son Jesus' name. Amen.